Holiday went quick this week and weekend, so it's good to be in the new year, and I'm thankful for our time together. Uh, just a brief announcement before we begin. Um, we have reserved the Civic Center for February, so our contributions have covered all of January, as I mentioned last week. So if you do have any payments, please see me, and I will submit those to the Round Lake Civic Center for February. February only has four weeks in it, four Sundays, I should say. So I forget what the total is, but I, I can have an exact total next week for you. Our call to worship today comes from 1 John 4, 7 through 17. 1 John 4, 7 through 17, and this is what the Word of God says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who is not loved does not know God. But because God is love, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. If you'll bow with me, let's pray before we begin today. Father, we thank you for this new year that you have blessed us with, and by your mercy you've allowed us to even see. Lord, we're not even worthy of life itself, but you do allow us to live, and for that we do praise you. We ask that our time on earth would bring you glory, that we would use our days, each of them in, in the year, to praise you and to reflect who you are. Lord, we thank you for our time together this afternoon. We pray that it would honor you, be with us as we study, and our worship. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing for our opening hymn, one of my favorite hymns of all, The Love of God. You'll find it on the front page of your bulletin. Let's sing it together. Oh 
disobedient to the word, they may be won over without a word by their behavior of their wives, as they observe your pure and respectful behavior. Your adornment not, must not be merely the external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on apparel, but it should be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, the holy women of former times, who hoped in God, also used to adorn themselves, being subject to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have proved to be her children if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, Happy New Year. I'm so happy to be here with all of you uh, again this day as we open up the word together and study it and worship the Lord together. What a great way to begin the new year in church. We are the body of Christ. We are doing what Christ wants us to do, devoting ourselves to the ministry of the word and hearing it and obeying it and Lord willing and by his help living it. Sometimes the scriptures give us commands and exhortations which so fly in the face of the world that when even the church hears them, they find those commands and exhortations hard to accept. The text that we come to today in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7 is one such passage. And since this is the case, uh, the case, I think we must especially ask the Lord to give us ears to hear and eyes to see and minds to understand and hearts to believe what Peter has to say to us as he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the Word of God is applicable throughout all time, the Word stands forever, and it has something to say to us uh, in our day and in our place. And so no matter what the world says, God's Word is true, and we stand on it, and we believe it, and we want to follow it as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us one more time come before the Lord and approach the throne of grace and ask him for these things to help us believe it. Oh Lord, sometimes your word contains difficult commands and we ask now that you would help us to not only believe that what the words say are true, 
but that we would live them. That you would remove and crucify our flesh and remove our pride and uh, give us a willingness to be submissive to what you have to say. For as we must master the word and know it, and it must be in our hearts, but more importantly, we must be mastered by the word. The word itself must have mastery over our lives, over our wills, and over every decision that we make. And so, Lord, please accomplish this by your mighty power through the Holy Spirit. Enable your servant now to speak your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Tim read the passage. I want to just focus in the beginning on verses 1 to 2. Peter writes, In the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. All right, already we can see how this could be controversial in our day, right? We have to remember as we read our Bibles that chapter and verse divisions were not originally in the text of Scripture. The Apostle uh, Peter wrote 1 Peter as a letter, and he wrote it and sent it out to Christians around the world. And so because chapter and verse divisions are not themselves inspired by the Spirit and were added long after the text was already written and the Bible was compiled and put together, uh, sometimes these divisions that are in the text, which were put there for our benefit to try to help us, where we could know, okay, this is where I'm at in, say, 1 Peter, so that when I'm speaking about it, other people will know where in the book I'm talking about. So chapter and verse divisions are very beneficial and helpful to us, but they're not inspired and they're not always perfect. So what happens sometimes is you'll find a verse that starts in the middle of a sentence, or in this case, in chapter 3, a whole chapter that starts with the thought of the previous chapter. That's why Peter says, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your husband. Um, so this is in reference to Peter's commands in chapter 2, which were what? As we've been studying for the last few weeks, the command that Peter issues is to honor the authorities that God has placed over us. God has appointed governors and kings, and there is no authority that exists except for that which he himself has placed. Um, and then Peter, toward the end of chapter 2, put forth Christ's great example of humility and meekness in the face of the most awful conditions. For Christ himself went as a lamb to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth, but he went and he died on the cross for us. And he showed the sort of humility giving us an example to follow by doing so. That... We ourselves must be humbled under the mighty hand of God. That we ourselves must pattern our lives after the great example of the Lord Jesus, um, who, though he was God, um, considered equality with God not something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Peter begins the third chapter of his epistle by now, applying the example of Christ to how wives and husbands are to relate to one another. For those of you who are married, you know that marriage can be a great blessing in many ways, but it can also be extraordinarily challenging. Whenever two sinners live together in the closest possible proximity to one another, there is inevitably going to be friction at some point. And if there isn't yet, there will be. That's for sure. And we must remember that when the scriptures command something of us, it is usually because we naturally do the opposite thing of what the scripture is commanding us. Right? So that when Peter says, in the same way you wives be submissive to your husbands, the reason that Peter is saying to the wives, be submissive to your husbands, is because submission does not come naturally to wives. Actually, it comes naturally to none of us. Because we're sinners. We want to be the king of our own domain, the captain of our own uh, life. And, and 
We don't want to be in subjection to anyone. But especially in this case, Peter singles out wives. He's going to talk about husbands too, but he singles out wives and he says to them, be submissive to your own husbands. And uh, so I'm going to say some very, very controversial things now. Things which the world rejects and teaches the opposite of. Um, but God's word cannot be watered down by the faithful minister. And my conscience is held captive to the word of God. And so I must teach what the scripture teaches. And I must say what the Lord says and be faithful to God's calling to me as a minister to preach the truth. No matter if people like it or don't like it. <laughs> I, I cannot be concerned with whether the audience actually likes the message that I'm preaching. All I can be concerned with is whether or not I'm faithful to actually speak and explain what God wants me to say. That's my calling. That's what I have to do. And so, though it's controversial, um, sorry, but not sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry at all. All right, so Peter tells wives in verse 1, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Oh, is there a more contentious thing to say in today's culture than this? This is the exact opposite of the overwhelming message of our society and our time. It is the opposite of the slogan that the, wo the world has today. That, that, in essence, women have today. Anything you can do, I can do better. Instead of wives submitting to their husbands, the theme is submit? Never. Men are the enemy. And how our culture promotes this narrative with words like, toxic masculinity or phrases that we find now so often if you watch the news or go on social media smash the patriarchy um, we will not have a man to rule over us and what has occurred in America and around the Western world is the masculinization of women and the feminization of men. And the problems of the world, according to society, are due to the fact that women are in bondage to their husbands, says the world, and they need to be liberated from that bondage. Women must be liberated from the bondage of being a stay-at-home mother or something to that effect. But listen, dear friends, feminism is not the answer to our ills. Women's liberation movement, as it is from the 60s until now, is actually a great cause of society's ills and not the solution to it. We have seen the fruit of these things, the fruit of the sexual revolution and feminism over the last 60 years, haven't we? The destruction of the nuclear family, and in its place, a liberalized and liberated and feminized society that has turned its back on the value and the structure and even the very definition of marriage, even the very definition of woman, and the very definition of man has been called into question uh, uh, and ultimately jettisoned as something a relic of a bygone era where there used to be two genders and now there's something like 10,000. Um, the old preacher Adrian Rogers once said, the progression went like this, Adam's rib, Satan's fib, women's lib. <laughs> I know I might get in trouble for saying these things, but that's all right. That's how it went, isn't it? That's how it went. Adam's rib, Satan's fib, women's lib. That's the progression. And it's true that 
In the past century, there's been a, a radical reaction to some real abuses. That is true. But these have led to wrong values and wrong solutions to those problems. And now the culture has become so twisted that a phrase like gender roles or a word like submission is more offensive to our collective minds than almost anything else. I can prove that this is the case. I can prove that this is the case. Wives who are in this room now are listening. When you hear these words, listen now, when you hear the words, wives, submit to your husbands, is the first thing that pops into your head all the ways in which wives should not have to submit to your husbands. I know this, that even me, as a man, as I read that, wives be submissive to your own husbands. As I read it, and I was thinking about how am I going to preach this, the first thing that came into my mind was, I'm going to have to make sure that I address all the, but what about this? But what about this scenario? Do I still have to submit then in this scenario? And, or in that scenario? Like, does it still apply then? And, and the fact that I know that I would have to address that is a part of the problem. It's part of the problem. It's a part of the heart set of the culture. That we cannot even say something and not even repeat a text of scripture without thinking of the ways and that we can have loopholes to get around it. So let me just briefly say this. Are there cases in which it is right for a wife not to submit to her husband? Yes. Yes. If he leads her into sin, she should not submit. If a husband says to his wife, hey, will you help me rob the bank tomorrow? She should say no. I, the Lord says, who is my true king and my ultimate husband, you shall not steal. Okay? Like, there it is. That's where a husband is trying to lead his family or his wife into sin. She should not submit. If he is beating and abusing her, she should not simply take it. Okay. Let's get those scenarios out of the way and really listen to what Peter has to say. The inspired apostle of Christ is telling us something for our benefit. When Christ, when Christ gives a command, whether it's Christ himself or Christ through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, when he gives a command to us, it is always for our good. And it is always for the glory of God. And it is always the right thing to do. Always. And so he gives this command, submit, wives submit. The world will say that Peter is nuts. Peter's crazy. Wives submit to your husband. We're living in the 21st century. Wives submit to your husbands. Like, how's the opposite working out for you? Right? read a book by a guy named Mark Stein. He's not a Christian. He's a Jewish guy. It was about America being uh, the last hope in the world against the spread of Islam because the birth rates in Islamic countries are like seven births to every family. And in Europe, it's like 0.7 births to every family. Something like that. In America, it's a little bit higher. It's like 1.1 births for every family. And at that rate, Western society is going to collapse. I mean, it's just a matter of time. It's just, just the case. And part of the reason for that symptom of a lower birth rate is exactly what I've been talking about here. It's this. It's the women's liberation movement. It's a lack of submission to biblical authority. Now, we don't submit because of the rise of Islam. Who cares about it? That. We submit because Christ is telling us to, through Peter. Yeah, the world says Peter's crazy, but just look at the world now. 
And if people put into practice what Peter is saying here, there would be much more joy and much more peace and much more fruitfulness, not only in the country and in the world, but in our homes. If we are to live our lives in the prescribed way that God made the family, like, imagine that. Like, just imagine that. And so many of those who rebel against this command are those who have never actually walked it. They rebel against it without actually walking it. They say, like, oh, what bondage that would be. Oh, well, have you actually tried to listen to what Peter has to say? Have you actually tried to obey the Lord? Because if you do, you would find that that's freedom. That's real freedom. Obeying Jesus is freedom. But Peter tells wives to submit. That means within the context of marriage, the man has the role of leader. And the really interesting thing is, Peter doesn't tell wives to submit only if the husband is a good leader. He says... Even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Do you see that? You wives, if you have a husband who is disobeying Christ, if you are living for Christ, in obedience to Christ, your husband will see your life, that's what Peter is saying here, that they will observe your chaste and respective behavior and respectful behavior. And you may be used by God to win your husband over. You may be used by God as the instrument through which your husband, who may or may not be a believer perhaps, will actually come to faith by looking at your walk. Notice this really interesting phrase that Peter uses, without a word. He may be won over without a word. Now, some of you have heard me say before, I really hate that phrase that, I, I don't know, was it a, uh, attributed to Thomas Aquinas or one of them? Uh, preach the gospel and if necessary use words. And then someone gives a justification for that in this verse like, Oh, you may win your husband without a word. See? Preach the gospel and if necessary use words. That's not what this is talking about. This does not mean that if you're a wife and you have a husband who's, a, who's not a believer, you came to faith in Jesus after you were married already. That you never share the gospel with him with your mouth. That's not what this is talking about. Rather, what Peter is referring to is what Solomon already referred to a thousand years before. A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Proverbs 27, 15. And better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Proverbs 25, 24. Listen, don't be mad at me for saying these things. That's Solomon you should be mad at. All right. No, you shouldn't be mad at him. You should listen to him. In verse 2, we see how the worldly husband is won over by observing his wife's chaste and respectful behavior. Um... Again, wives, I want to ask the question for you to ponder in your hearts and minds. What is your reaction to this? Your husband must observe your chaste and respectful behavior. You must be in submission to the leader of your household. That is the way that God designed marriage. What is your reaction to that? Your internal gut feeling when you hear Peter saying that you need to live this way. Is it this? Yes. Yes. I see myself being disrespectful at times. I need to go home tonight and repent of that. I need to say to my husband, I'm sorry. I haven't been the wife that I'm called to be. And I want to be that for you. I want to be that to you. I want to submit to the Lord Jesus. And in doing so, submit to your leadership. And I love you. And even if I haven't been perfect at that before, I'll do my best to obey the Lord now. Or is it this? Well, my husband hasn't earned my respect. Right? Why do I have to respect him? He hasn't earned it. You don't know what this guy's like, a worthless man. Right? Because if your reaction is the second one, he hasn't earned my respect, 
you must realize that in the same way husbands are to love their wives unconditionally, even when their wives are not acting very lovely, right? Husbands are called to unconditional love of their spouses. And wives are to respect their husbands, even when they haven't earned it as well. Obedience in this area is an act of worship. Submission to your husband is submission to Christ. Man, I know, I know that, like, that has to be hard for some of you to hear. I know it. But believing that, trusting that that's the case, that when I do so in obedience to the Word of God, that you actually may be enabled to submit your will to your husband's leadership in your marriage by realizing that you're actually following Christ by obedience, right? That is the way that you may be enabled to actually carry this out. Because if it relies simply on the character of your husband, you might say, yeah, that's an impossible command. It's an impossible thing. Unless in so doing that, the reason for my doing so is because I love Jesus more than anything else. And I will listen to him. And I will lay down my desires for Christ's desires. And true women's liberation is freedom from worldly bondage by obedience to Jesus Christ. Listen, some of you may even know what I'm talking about here as well. The worldly, what calls itself worldly liberation, is actually truly bondage. It's bondage to sin. It really is. I was in bondage to sin. Not in the same way that a woman can be in bondage to sin, but I certainly was. It was true bondage. But in Christ there's freedom. And in verses 3 to 4, Peter gives practical application of these principles. How then are we to put these things into practice? Look at verses 3 and 4. But let it be the hidden person... Oh, I'm sorry. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. Oh my. In one verse, Peter has utterly destroyed the fashion industry. Alright, seriously. He's just destroyed the fashion industry in verse 3. Braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses. These are the things which inundate us on a daily basis everywhere we look. Every time we drive down the highway, we see billboards for it. Every time we turn on the television, we see commercials for it. Every time we watch a show on television, we see this lived out. That this here is what actually gives value to a person. There's a reason why television shows have set designers and have wardrobe people that are paid millions of dollars to make sure the wardrobe is perfect. The outward man. That's all they're concerned with. That's all the world is concerned with. The world intends to deceive girls into thinking that outward adornment is the only thing that matters. You need to watch your weight. You need to put on makeup. You need to spend massive amounts of money at the salon. You need to have the best and most current style of clothing. Oh, but listen to the word of God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. And Paul also says that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with a braided hair and gold and pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness. What are they to adorn themselves with? With good works. That's Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 9 10. So, do these verses mean that if you have braids in your hair or wear jewelry, you're somehow sinning? No. Rather, 
A godly woman must not think that by doing these things, she is doing what is actually pleasing or valuable in the sight of God. Christ is the pattern for the wife, of course, as well as the husband, as we are going to see. Christ's submission, Christ's gentleness, Christ's quiet spirit. Peter says that when a wife puts on those things, they are precious in the sight of God. When a wife has a quiet spirit, that is precious in the sight of God. When a wife, in obedience to Christ, submit to, submits to her husband's leadership, that is precious in the sight of God. When a, a woman, a wife, is gentle toward her husband, that is precious in the sight of God. And these things, says Peter, are imperishable qualities. Look at this. Look at the text. He says, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So, you know, hair falls out, jewelry breaks, dresses get eaten by moths, but an excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of his life. Wow, she is so much more valuable than rubies, than precious stones. And then Peter goes one step further, and he gives an example of what he's talking about. What a godly wife looks like from the scriptures. Look at verses 5 and 6. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, look at this, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So, you know what's really striking to me as I read that verse in verse 5? Is that Peter says the word, in former times, people used to act this way. In former times. The reason Peter says this is because in the first century, the seeds of rebellion to God's ordained marital order were already sprouting. They were sprouting in places like Corinth. They were sprouting in the pagan world. And even in the Jewish world, they were sprouting up. So that Peter, like here we are in the 21st century, 2021. Wow, it's so crazy. And, and, and I can look back and say like, man, if only things were like they were back in the 1950s or something like that. Right? right? Before the sexual revolution of the, of the 60s and all of that. Well, Peter is saying this. Let's go all the way back. Back in former days, when holy women of God used to act like holy women of God, back in the times of Abraham, see this letter is utterly contemporary, but it's also ancient, and man has not changed in 2,000 years. Man has not changed in 6,000 years. That's a fact. Peter saw the moral de degradation of his own culture, and he says, look back to how things used to be. Women used to adorn themselves with submission to their husbands. The picture here is that godly submission is an adornment to the wife. It is far more precious than any jewel or a diamond or gold necklace. A necklace may impress people who do not know you, but the adornment of the godly obedience to your husband and to the Lord is precious in God's sight. And Peter then gives an example of Sarah in Genesis 18, 12, when she heard that she would bear a child in her old age. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? She's not saying the Lord God is old. That's not who she's referring to in that text. She's talking about Abraham, and she calls Abraham, the Hebrew word Adonai. She calls Abraham Adonai, Lord, Master. You think
think about that. She literally actually calls Abraham master. Have you ever, to the wives in this room, call it your husband master? <laughs> no. <laughs> Have you ever said to him? <laughs> Has he ever said to you something like, what would you like to watch on television? And have you said to him, whatever you wish, Master? Right? <laughs> Maybe not. Right? Maybe not. After I've worn out and my Lord, my Master, my Adonai is old, shall I have this pleasure? She's not saying he was the Lord God. She's saying he was the Master of their home. Listen to what Peter says at the end of verse 6. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Okay, now we get to the heart of the matter. The objection, the reason for the objection, other than just plain rebellion against God, there is another reason, which is also part of rebellion, but, but there, there's like a, a, a mind reason why people don't want to submit, why, why a wife might be scared to submit. So Peter says, you become her children if you've done what is right without being frightened by any fear. What fear is he referring to? Well, very simply, the fear of being taken advantage of. The fear that if I submit to my husband, he's going to walk all over me. The fear that, like, if I do this thing and lay down my own sense of wanting to be the leader of my house and... and Give that to my spouse and say, I am your wife. I am your help me. I will submit to you in Christ. That what that's going to do to my husband, I already know. He's going to take full advantage of it. And he's going to be mean to me. He's going to walk all over me. And I'm just going to be a rug in front of the door that he's going to step on. I'm afraid of that. And so I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm too scared. That's the reason why Peter says that. Do what is right without being frightened by any fear. These sorts of fears prevent submission. And let me tell you right now, if you submit in the way Christ calls you to, listen now, this is really important, you might be taken advantage of. You might be. You might be walked on. But God is the one who sees your obedience. He is the one to whom your husband will have to answer to if he does that, if he takes advantage of you in that way. And therefore, you do not need to be afraid. Remember what verse 1 says? In the same way also, the same way as what? The same way as Christ, who was reviled and crucified, and yet went as a lamb to the slaughter in obedience to his Father for our salvation. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And what Peter says to you wives is in the same way you must do so as well. You must do so as well. That's his command. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I will say, of course, as I come to the following verses, husbands can make it easier or harder for their wives to submit based on their own conduct. That's for sure. That's for sure. A woman might find it much easier to submit to a husband who actually really does love them and care for them and, and is serving them than one who is, you know, a jerk. Peter is not silent about the husband's role. Look at verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman... And show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, so see what it said in verse 1, in the same way? How does verse 7 start? In the same way. So look at that. Is what Peter, is what he is asking the husband to do in any way different than what he is asking the wife to do? 
I mean, there's a different application in the way that it's lived out, but it's the same reason and the same purpose. We husbands are to be Christ to your wife. You are to be Christ to her. Lay down your life for her. Love her as Christ loved the church. That's what Peter tells us, I mean, Paul tells us to do. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker. How husbands need to hear this word, just the same as wives need to hear the previous word. It was not Adam who was deceived, but Eve. The reason that the serpent approached her is because he knew that she was the weaker vessel. Like, these things, you know, they're just the truth. They're just the plain truth of Scripture. Men, men need to understand their wives are the weaker vessel. And so you must not take advantage of them. Does not even this, I, I have to just ask the wives another rhetorical question now for you to think about. Does not even this, being called a weaker person, great against your pride, weaker? Who's calling me weaker? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Peter says, <laughs> look at, just look at verse 7 again. I, for some reason, I, I laugh, not because I'm laughing at, at the apostle, I laugh because <laughs> of how, like, clearly this word just cuts right through all the baloney of the world today. It just cuts right through it, just like a knife, like could Peter, did Peter the man understand that there was going to be like all this gender stuff in 2021? Well, probably not, but God did. God knows. God takes the word and applies it to every situation. Oh man, and look at what he says. You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way. As with some, someone weaker, uh, you know, since she is a woman. <laughs> right? Like, what? Um... Is Peter a misogynist? No, he's merely speaking the truth. Has, has the truth become something so utterly foreign to us that when we hear it, it sounds like some alien thing? When we hear something as plain as the wife is the weaker vessel, since she is a woman, that like something so like biologically plain and evident, self-evident, Becomes like a, I don't want to hear that thing. Don't you say that. Anything you can do, I can do better. There's a problem there. There's something wrong. Women are the weaker vessel. Therefore, their husbands must be understanding of that. Bear with that. Love their wives as Christ loved the church. Listen, the church is weaker than Christ himself. And yet, for all of its misgivings, Jesus loves her and lays down his life for her. Though he is King Jesus, he lays down his life for his bride, the church. Men are therefore to show honor to their wives as fellow heirs. Listen, this is so crucial, so crucial. Not lesser heirs. Peter does not say that women are lesser heirs. He says fellow heirs. Not with lesser value, but with lesser strength. That's why a man must provide and gently take care of his wife. I was talking about this this morning with a godly woman. I was talking about this, what I'm about to preach on. And she said to me, a wife should be sweeping the dust away from the door as her husband enters. And the husband should run over to her and lift her up and say, No, my dear wife, you do not need to do that for me. I love you. How can I help you today? In other words, both are serving one another. Both are in submission to one another. Both are acting as Christ toward one another in the same way. As Christ did this, you wives do that. In that way, you will be acting like Christ to your husband. Husbands, in the same way, love your wives as the weaker vessel. For Christ loves the church, which is the weaker vessel than he is. 
Yeah. When this does not happen, when men don't do this, Peter intimates that the husband's prayers may be hindered. Wow, that's a scary thing. The husband is not acting like a godly husband. And when he prays to the Lord, there is a sense in which his prayer to the Lord might be hindered, that God will not listen to it. Um, why would it be hindered? I'll tell you why. For the same reason that you don't have to be afraid of submitting. Because God is watching. That's why. That's why you don't have to have fear, because God is watching. You don't have to be afraid. God is God. And we know that because if a man is treating his wife poorly, his prayers will be hindered. Why? Because God is watching. He'll take care of it. He avenges his mind, says the Lord. Therefore, listen now, therefore, you know, you don't have to be a dripping faucet, right? God will take care of it. And you better not, if you're a man, be some, you know, bull in the china shop and bowl your wife over. Because if you do that, God is watching. And your prayers will be hindered. Therefore, friends, since Christ has so loved his church by laying down his life for her, in submission to his Father's will, what must our conduct be within the context of marriage? I just wrote down five words adjectives. We must be unselfish. We must be sympathetic to our spouse's interests. We must have communion with one another. There must be unity in, in the Lord. And there must be consistency in these things. Consistency. I, you know, it doesn't matter if you go home today and say like, well, okay, I haven't been doing these things. Your husband, the husbands, you go to your wife today and say, I'm sorry, I have not been the kind of husband who lays down his life for you and I want to be that more. I want to serve you. I want to take care of you as a weaker vessel. I want to be strong for you and I want to do these things for you and I want to be there for you. Please forgive me. But it doesn't do any good if you say that today and then tomorrow you go back to the old way of doing things. There must be consistency. You must live it. Jesus left heaven and became a man. He gave himself throughout his life, spending his strength to bless his beloved. He gave himself in death to ransom his church. That's it. That's what Christ does for us. He does that for us. He laid down his life for us. It's really the whole point that Peter has been making at the second half of chapter 2 and the first half of chapter 3 of his first epistle. Because he says, Lord willing, we'll learn about it um, next week. He says in verse 8, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. I don't, I don't want to steal my thunder for next week. But like he's saying, to sum up, that that's... That's what I'm calling you to. These things. I'm calling you to be these things. Be the body of Christ as you were meant to be. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful love to us. For giving us in Christ the pattern of submission. The pattern of love. The pattern of humility for us to follow. And he is the great example for us. And so, Lord, wherever we have failed in these ways, we know that there is new mercies every morning, and we ask for your mercy and your grace to be upon us. And we ask that you would accomplish your will in our lives, that we would deny ourselves lay down our lives so that we would deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're going to um, take communion now.
I'm so grateful that the Lord has, yeah, you can pass it out. Yeah. I'm so grateful that the Lord has um, established this ordinance in his church to recall to our remembrance our absolute need of him. Thanks, brother. Our absolute need of him and dependency upon him. Because what this is saying when we take the bread and the drink, what it's saying is, I have an absolute desperate need of Christ. Outside of Christ, I'm lost and fallen and gone forever. And I cannot be redeemed outside of what he's done for me. But in Christ, there's hope. And so, as we take this together, we also acknowledge that nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. There is no righteousness in myself. It is all in what Christ did for us. He gives us His righteousness. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. We fall short of all these glorious commands, these wonderful things which are the pattern of life that you have for us. We fall short of it so often, even daily. And we need your grace and we need your mercy and we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live for you. And so please accomplish all of those things, Lord. Make us into the men and women that you want us to be. Reconcile us to yourself in the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to sing a closing hymn now. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Oh, as I, as I preach this text, isn't, isn't this an appropriate song for us to sing? An appropriate hymn that... That outside of being near to the cross, none of us can submit. None of us can lay down our lives for another person and lay down our wills for them. But in Christ we are able to. Let's sing together, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me
God to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless in the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God be with you all.